Tonight's guest has been a promoter, a photographer, a color commentator, an author, an agent, and we will tell him that he's the second greatest manager in the history of professional wrestling, but we all know he's really the first. He's the Louisville Lip. He's the Louisville Slugger. He is the one and only James E. Cornette. Thank you so much for joining the two-man power trip of wrestling. Well, guys, it's great to be on the, on the show again. I appreciate you asking me back. It just You said you were going to pinch yourself. I didn't know it was that kind of show now. I mean, if you guys are in the privacy of your own home, if you want to do these things. but <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what. I mean, like I said, it's the missing piece to so many puzzles because we've had on so many guests that just either sing your praises or talk about a funny experience they had with you or an interaction or Something that either happened in a match, in the case of Bobby Eaton, but we'll get back to him as we go <laughs> down the line. But I got to start or, or off. I'm, and I'm, sure, I'm sure half of your guests, uh, you know, probably say, "Oh, that no good." Because you know, here's the thing: it, one thing that I do not do is inspire blasé apathy. You, I either should be elected president or run out of the country on a rail in people's minds. One or the other. <laughs> Well, we are in a presidential season, so with that being said, I got to say, and it's and hey, enough, if, I, I mean, if, I, I, if a knucklehead dipshit like Donald Trump can get as far as he's gotten just by spouting bullshit, then certainly I've got better bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of funny that, you know, we have so much we want to talk about with your career, but I got to just start currently because you can't check a, quote, wrestling news website or find out where you get your wrestling news. I'm doing air quotes when I say that without seeing Jim Cornette's name. And, of course, last week there was some news that came out regarding your feelings on Lucha Underground, but that's not even where I want to go. I want to talk about today what I've seen in terms of a disrespect of somebody who's helped lay the groundwork of professional wrestling and modern professional, what was professional wrestling, now it's sports entertainment. But I just want to get your take on what you've seen, especially I've seen some interactions today that just are, are absolutely appalling to me. The disrespect of somebody of your stature. When you look at, quote, wrestling media, you know, what, what are your thoughts when you look at it and how it's evolved to what it is now? Well, no, now, now it's no disrespect at all because, after all, when I go to my doctor who's been a practicing physician for 30 years, I tell him what's what with my blood test. So naturally, you know, people, I just, as a matter of fact, over the weekend, I watched an entire box set of season four of Family Guy, and now I'm qualified to write animated sitcoms for Fox Television. Uh, <laughs> you know, here's the thing. If, if they'd have just got their semantics straight, I wouldn't be so upset with them. Uh, on my show, The Jim Cornette Experience, uh, I've recently hired an anger management therapist trying to make me a kinder and gentler Jim Cornette in 2016, the great Brian Last, an old friend of mine from New York. And I asked him, I said, find me something about modern wrestling that I'll like. Give me some things to watch. And he sent me a couple of things. And one of them was a match that uh, my good friend Ric Flair's daughter Charlotte had in, in NXT. And I, I praised that very highly. I thought it was one of the better uh, girls' matches that I've ever seen. Uh, right up there with Gail Kim and Awesome Kong and, and TNA, which was probably the best girls' match in the United States I've ever seen. And then he showed me some of that Lucha Underground. And I thought it was the biggest bunch of horse shit I've ever seen in my life because it's obviously a scripted, choreographed the television show with writers. It's it, more writers in wrestling. That's all we need. And, and everybody knows that's what's caused the ruin of the business today. And I said that, and, oh, my God, everybody went nuts because somehow or another – since their cognitive abilities have been impaired by the the low class programming that they watch, apparently it's given them brain damage. They didn't understand what I was saying. They kept saying, "Well, this is the best sports entertainment," and blah blah blah. Exactly, it's sports entertainment. It ain't wrestling. It's garbage, horseshit when it comes to wrestling because it's obviously scripted. No attention is made to to make it look like a sport, like a conflict, like a contest, like it's actually happening. There's no thought whatsoever put into making the the people on the television program actually legitimate, like you could really believe in them, like you could believe in a Stone Cold Steve Austin, or you could believe in a Nature Boy Ric Flair, or any big stars, just a bunch of guys doing a bunch of flips and a bunch of, t of TV writers spending somebody else's money. It looks like a John Ford Western. It was shot tremendously. The production is fantastic, but it's just another case of garbage wrestling. Now, if they'd have asked me and, I, and, and said, I, is it sports entertainment? I would have said, yes, exactly. That's the biggest insult that I can give anything in the world today, that I could call it sports entertainment. That's, that's lower than calling your mother a two-bit whore on the street. 
if you call something sports entertainment in my mind. So, yes, it's sports entertainment. That's exactly what's wrong with it. But it ain't wrestling. And for these people who think it is wrestling, I've just been uh, actually – this has been called to my attention over the past few days. It's not really their fault because so many of these kids on Twitter – are so young, elsewise they wouldn't be on Twitter. They'd actually have a life and they'd have, you know, like a girl or something. But <laughs> so many of these kids on Twitter now, it's been so long since they've seen wrestling, they don't know what it's supposed to look like anymore. So I'm trying to educate them, but there's where the disrespect comes in because I try to educate them and they just won't listen. So that's where the disrespect comes in. Not that it's, it's not their fault that they don't know what they're talking about. It is their fault when they don't want to learn better. But it's like bringing, you know, uh, a couple rocks to it, like a you know, machine gun fight. You know, you just don't want to spar with somebody who not only, you know, you have the, the, the sports – business acumen of being in professional wrestling, you know, for 35, 40 years, however long you've been in it at this point, but the fact that, yes, this Twitter universe, social media, the way we look at things from every perspective, up, down, Periscope, live tweets, this and that, professional wrestling is a lost art, sports entertainment is now running supreme, and, you know, there really is no kind of... uh, There's no relationship anymore because now it's just, you know, a a bunch of athleticism uh, and a bunch of good-looking guys, you know, and girls. Oh, yeah. You know, I I don't – I never argue with that. It is definitely a bunch of athleticism. It's a bunch of guys that are unfortunately risking their health and their bodily safety for no reason. For no reason because nobody believes any of this shit anymore because the corporate America and all the writers – The comedy writers, the jock sniffers, as I call them, that if they were caught in a men's locker room, they'd be whistling Stranger in Paradise. They get in and say, well, (laughs) I can do this so much better. I can come up with these fantasy concepts, and I can write lines for these wrestlers to recite. It's horseshit. And unfortunately, that's where we're at these days. And I've had so many people on Twitter that, once again, their cognitive abilities are impaired, and they don't understand what's going on or what's being said. They say, oh, well, there's, there's a news bulletin. Wrestling is not real. Wrestling's predetermined. They think that I honestly believe that people don't know that. Of course I know that. That's the point. The point is that people have been beaten over the head with the fact that wrestling is fake, and that's why wrestling doesn't draw anymore. That's why nobody gives a shit about wrestling compared to the old days, because they know it's not only, not, not, not only know it's fake, but they know how it's all done. And if you didn't know how it was done, you can watch one episode of Lucha Underground and you can figure it out because it's plain as the nose on your face right in front of you. That fucking happy horse shit is fake. Here's the problem. The problem basically is that in decades gone by, almost everybody, although there were many exceptions, but a large number of people knew that wrestling was somehow there was something going on. There's something predetermined. There's something not. Something's happening, but they didn't know what. They didn't know why. They didn't know how. They didn't know who, and they didn't know to what extent. I know that Chris Angel doesn't get run over with a steamroller and flattened out and then picked up with a spatula and fluffed back out, but I can't go on the Internet and look at the, at the blueprints for that trick, so I don't know how it's done. Therefore, it's a hell of a thing to look at, and I want to see it again. But once I read those blueprints and I look at those plans and I see exactly how it's done and it's not as difficult as I thought it was, then I don't give a shit anymore. So these stupid, dumb fuck wrestlers and promoters are allowing these stupid, dumb fuck writers to come in and sniff their jocks and tell them what to do. And as a a result, all the credibility and all the mystery has gone out of the business. And that's why. And once again, it's not the kid's fault because they don't bother to learn and they're not old enough to know Nowhere in any given point in history have fewer people watched professional wrestling on television, fewer people watched professional wrestling live, fewer live professional wrestling events have been staged, and fewer people have been making money at professional wrestling than right now. Explain to me how that is evolution. I, that's, like, that's like the fish starts out with eyes and then becomes blind. It's going backwards. <laughs> <laughs> Evolution yeah. is supposed to move forwards. Unbelievable. And I'll tell you, you had a great quote about the fact that the city of what was it? The city of Memphis had uh, a, you know four hundred thousand dollar gate or whatever it was. You know, no, over, I'll, I'll, uh, tell you, I'll tell you exactly what it was. Yeah, it, it was the quote. 
This is and this is borne out by the facts, by newspaper research, and by actually you can read about it in my new book, Tuesday Night at the Gardens, Pro Wrestling in Louisville, available at jimcornett.com. In 1974, the first year that Jerry Lawler was a main event attraction in Memphis, Tennessee, the Mid South Coliseum had 50. That's 5050 wrestling events in that calendar year. And for those 50 events, they sold right at 400,000 tickets. That means an average of 8,000 people week in, week out, 50 times over the course of the year in one city. The population of Memphis in that year was 720,000, actually the population of Shelby County, Tennessee. For New York to do the same percentage of the population in wrestling tickets as Memphis did that year, they would have had to have 50 events at Madison Square Garden, and those events would have had to draw 89,000 fans each. And I said that Vince McMahon and the WWE will be lucky if this year, if they sell, and and you take WrestleMania out of the equation, because what the fuck, if in this country, the United (laughs) States of America, if the WWE sells 400,000 live event tickets this year, they'll probably be lucky in the entire country, not just one city. And then some knucklehead thought he was a math major, got on Twitter and said, well, the Barclays Center in Brooklyn holds 18,000 people, and 52 times that, like every Raw draws 18,000 people. <laughs> like even that 18,000 for real in the Barclays Center instead of what they just announced. He doesn't realize they work the attendance figures, too, in the WWF these days. They have to because they're not filling up the buildings anymore. My God, the the stunning ignorance. I just try to enlighten people that they have fucked the business up because once that – I liken it to this. And, guys, I don't know. Are either one of you married? You got girlfriends? Both married. Very oh, good. Both then married, in that yeah. case, then I'll say it's somebody else. It's not you guys. It's somebody else has a crush on a beautiful girl, Right. And you, you admire this girl, and you love this girl, and you, you, you just dream about this girl. And finally, you work up the courage, and you go up to her, and you invite her out to dinner. And she accepts. And you're over the moon. You're so happy. And then she follows that up with, I don't like you, and I wouldn't fuck you in a million years, but I'm looking forward to the free meal. That's exactly what we've done now in the wrestling industry. We have told the fans all those, t- all those years we were yanking your chain, and now we're still yanking your chain, but we expect you to buy this shit anyway, even though we tell you that we're not really mad at each other, and it's all a show. That is the stupidest thing that I've ever heard of. Whether it is or not, whether you think you know or not, until they could prove it, which they couldn't, until we got the corporate people and the jock-sniffing comedy writers involved, You never knew for sure, and they still came back so they could try to figure it out for themselves. Once they know, because you've told them, there's no reason to do this anymore. And then people get upset at me because I report this, and they say he's bitter because he doesn't have a job anymore. I'm 54 years old. I didn't stick all my money up my fucking nose. I don't want a job. I don't like to leave the house to get the mail, much less to go on the road. I pick my spots where I want to go, when I want to go, and if I don't want to go somewhere, I don't go there. I work for who I want to based on who I like and who treats me nice. I don't have to put up with people I don't enjoy in my life anymore. That's part of being old and being semi-retired. But somehow that's, that's turned against me. <laughs> so I sit here and I fuck with people on Twitter because they're so easy to fuck with because they're stupid and they don't get it. That is very, very true. Now, you mentioned Memphis, and i got to go back in time to when you started in Memphis, because we recently talked to Jerry Jarrett, and then we talked to Bill Dundee not that long ago, and obviously both uh, mentioned you and mentioned you in good light, of course. With you starting out down there in the crazy territory of Memphis, obviously a hotbed at one point, what was it like down there, you know, with all those guys, with Jerry Lawler, Jerry Jarrett, even uh, Dundee? Is that a crazy experience? Well, it, it was, and I was so lucky. And, and this, of course, the area that I grew up in. I started watching wrestling in Louisville literally a year or so, a year and a half after Jerry Jarrett had opened it up. Uh, Louisville was dark, as my book mentioned. Uh, no live events, no television shows for years before Jerry Jarrett came up here and, and started back in 1970 running wrestling in Louisville. And shortly after that, as a kid, I found it on television, and I was just instantly attracted to it. And going to the matches live every Tuesday night at the Louisville Gardens, and weekly matches, once again, 52 weeks a year, and not only seeing 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 screaming fans every week just living and dying with what these guys did, but being able to see the, the array of talent 
and the incredible creativity when it came to the matchmaking to keep can you imagine having a roster of 15 or 20 wrestlers in an area and being able to keep it fresh every week week in and week out with you know main event matches and and great stipulations and and tremendous performances it was a, a tremendous way to learn the industry first as a fan and then later on when i got closer and became a, a ringside photographer a ring announcer writing the programs and then finally i had been actually professionally working in wrestling for six years by the time i was twenty years old and got to be a manager and that's just that's an opportunity that's not available to anybody anymore uh... you know it's not available to anybody anymore to to go to fifty two live matches a year but you know unless you want to travel all over the country uh... so you know between the talent jerry lawler in the seventies and eighties was not only one of the top ten box office attractions in the business because of the huge crowds that he drew in, in Memphis and Lexington and Louisville and Nashville and et cetera, but Jerry Jarrett was, and Bill Dundee, uh, two of the, the best bookers uh, and finish men and, and, and just so creative, and the, the TV ratings were so huge. Everybody was a superstar. Once you were on Memphis TV for two or three weeks, everybody in town knew who you were. I mean, it, it the the... The effect cannot be overstated of being on Memphis television, especially since it was the highest rated locally produced television show of any kind in the United States of America. And uh, it was just, it was a great place to grow up, a great place to watch wrestling, a great place to learn. And they kind of did a cool thing with you when you were there, because obviously, you know, Jimmy Hart's there, and he's kind of like the main heel manager, but you're also there in, in, a, in a pretty prominent role. They kind of did a cool angle where you kept getting fired. What was the, you know, what was the basically the storyline and the idea behind that? Well, and and that's another thing. I've never heard the word storyline until the last ten or fifteen years or so when the writers started <laughs> coming in. But basically, Jerry Jarrett saw that I had been a photographer at Ringside for six years. I was going to all the towns in the circuit, so I was attending at that point. By the time that I was twenty years old, about one hundred and fifty live matches a year as a photographer, or ring announcer. And everybody, you know, had, had seen me. And he said, because since I had started before I was 16 years old and uh, I didn't have a driver's license, my mother had to take me to a lot of these matches. He said, uh, we're going to do what Playboy Gary Hart did when he first started in wrestling in like 1960. You're going to have a rich mother and she's going to buy your way in. Okay, I'm all ears, Jerry. <laughs> I would have I jumped off the roof if he'd have told me to, right? And the story was I couldn't carry off the playboy part like Gary Hart did. I was the, the rich little clueless putz, but the story was that I was going to get into wrestling as a manager, and my mother, because she was wealthy and had millions, was going to buy wrestlers for me and their contracts just like she'd gotten me everything else I ever wanted in life. And that was it. That's the whole premise. It wasn't overwritten and overthought and over-choreographed and over-scripted. It was that. Take that and run with it. So what would I do? I would go out and try to sign up the biggest hero in town, which is Jerry Lawler. Well, he didn't want anything to do with some teenage kid, rich kid that wants to be his manager, right? So he blows me off, and that makes me mad. So then I go to Bill Dundee, and he's mad because he, I was, he was my second choice, right? So you ask Lawler, and he turns you down, so you come to me. Fuck you, right? <laughs> then I go to Dutch Mantell. And Dutch Mantel signs with me and lets me manage him for a week. And, and my first appearance on a card in the Mid-South Coliseum, I was in the main event managing Dutch Mantel against Jerry Lawler for the Southern Heavyweight title. And I, of course, caused Dutch to lose because of my inexperience and foolishness. And then he brought me out the next week on TV, and he fired me because he said the only difference between me and Lawler and Dundee is I was willing to take you for a ride for the money, you idiot, but now you've cost me, so fuck you, get away from me. And with that, then I was upset, and I was mad, and I had been insulted, and the cornet name had been run through the mud and, and, and made fun of, and that's when I started signing up heels that were willing to go after these guys and try to put them out of wrestling and try to get revenge for me. And that's the way that over a period of a couple of months, I logically and credibly had a grudge against the heroes, and therefore I became a heel. Which that's is all it took. There was nothing even put on paper. And before I knew how to talk on television, the guys just talked around me, and all I had to do was react. We treated it like it was legitimate and like it was real, and we said what we would have said if those things had really been happening. 
That's all you needed to do. Now, eventually down there in Memphis, I guess, is that the first time you ended up meeting up with uh, beautiful Bobby and Dennis Condry? Is that where you kind of Oh, absolutely. Well, I'd, I'd known uh, uh, Dennis had been wrestling here in this area since 1975. As a matter of fact, uh, in the, the Midnight Express scrapbook that I did that unfortunately is out of print now, uh, all the copies sold, um, I, I reprinted a picture that I took of Dennis Condry. I was 13 years old. And he was a, a preliminary wrestler in 1975, and I took a picture of him. And I showed it to him years later, and I said, Dennis, I said, what would you have thought if somebody had come up to you and said, see that little 13-year-old kid that just took your picture? <laughs> well, him, he's going to be your manager. And the kid, the teenage kid in Huntsville, Alabama that's setting up the ring, he's going to be your tag team partner. <clears throat> and in, in nine years, you guys are going to main event the Superdome. What would you have said? <laughs> and he would have said, yeah, I don't think so. I think you're on drugs. Uh, yeah, and I'd known Bobby. Bobby had, had been a, a great riding partner of mine when I would travel to and from the, the matches, even as a photographer. And later on, uh, he was being managed by Jimmy Hart, but we would ride together because Jimmy lived in Memphis and and uh, was going a different place or a different direction. So it, it was it, once again, it was like taking two friends and, and being put together in a group and, and going off to a new territory. It was it was just fantastic. And Bill Dundee just mentioned, obviously, you know, he knows Bobby Eaton very, very well for obvious reasons, but he mentioned taking you and the Midnight Express and the Rock and Roll Express and bringing them down to Mid-South and selling out everywhere. And I mentioned that those tag matches are so unreal, you put them against anything, you know, in the last 20 years in tag wrestling, and it doesn't even come close. What is it about the Midnight Express and the Rock and Roll Express that just clicks so well? You know, I mean, talent for one thing, all four of those guys were just so good at what they did. Um, it really helped get me over because I could go out there and say the Midnight Express is the greatest tag team in the world and we're going to have the best match that you've ever seen against the Rock and Roll Express and we're going to win. And But if it hadn't come to pass when the people saw it, then they would have said Cornette's full of shit and we can't believe him. But they did. They were the best team, and they did go out and have the best matches. And, you know, Bobby was just a, a once-in-a-lifetime kind of talent in the ring, and Dennis was very, very underrated. He, he was the captain. He was the ring general at that point in time. He had more experience than all those guys, and he was the one who was leading the, the charge. And his his work was impeccable. His body language was tremendous. And then, of course, Ricky Morton, the the greatest selling and the sympathy that that underdog little blonde haired blue eyed kid would get when he got the shit kicked out of him and he'd he'd reach out to the front row fans and he would mouth the words help me and they would <laughs> many times <laughs> and and Robert Gibson was such an incredible athlete in those days and was so quick and 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 had enough size where he could be taken seriously he was six one or six two and two hundred and fifteen pounds and so he was the big guy for the team but he was just so quick and and so uh, his he had it in his genes too because Ricky's father was a referee and a wrestler from years back and Robert Gibson's brother Ricky Gibson was a tremendous wrestler in his day and had great matches with Jerry Lawler over the Southern title and it just you know it, everybody had Bobby had had been a natural and started watching wrestling when he was a kid but he'd been a pro from the time he was 15 so it just everybody was just it just clicked and it was the yin and yang uh every protagonist has has to have an antagonist every black hat has to have a white hat and vice versa for the rock and roll in the midnight we were mirror images of of the same coin just unbelievable fuse just absolutely great and you mentioned bobby eaton being such a great wrestler Obviously, you know, not so much for talker, but that's kind of where you fit in. Did you feel like the chemistry between you two guys was just per like almost too perfect? He, you know, he doesn't really talk. He can do it in the ring. You could talk, you know, get the, you know, get the quote-unquote heat on him. Well, yeah, I mean, the chemistry was a big part of it, and, and we were all friends. And then, you know, when, when Dennis uh, left the business and Stan took his place, uh, we had obviously known Stan from Memphis. And, and there was a chemistry there in that you couldn't find two different people outside the ring than Bobby Eaton and Stan Lane, but inside the ring, they'd both been tag team wrestlers. They'd both been 
uh, professionals for years. They knew what they were doing, and they they blended perfectly. You wanted a little contrast in personalities, and and that's what you got, you know. But it it worked together. So that's unfortunately another problem with wrestling today, with tag team wrestling that everybody laments is is you know has gone away. Uh, it the guys are all signed for the, to the big companies to individual contracts because before with the any tag team that was successful, they would come into a territory together, they would leave together, they would travel to different places together and work together, and they would be together for years. But now with each wrestler signed to individual contracts, it's up to the promoter or the writers, the dreaded writers, as to whether guys are put together. And they put together teams for a few months, and then they break them up, and they do something else. Nobody has a chance to get that experience and get good and travel to different places. There are no different places to travel to anymore. So that's another reason why tag team wrestling is a lost art, because nobody is able to apply themselves to it and be together long enough to be good at it. That is very, very true and very well said. Now, I think this might be an impossible question for you, but I just wanted to ask, you know, just kind of be a little bit funny with it, but, you know, us and me and Chad, we always talk about it, and you know, any of our friends, like, oh, who's your favorite incarnation of the Midnight? For me, I like Bobby and Stan. I don't know why. I think I just like them maybe a little bit better. But do you have a favorite incarnation of the group, or is that impossible to pick? <laughs> well, first I'll say it's like picking your favorite children. Somebody's going to get mad. Uh, <laughs> but I will say this: both of them were correct for the time. Uh, the the first three and a half years that we were together. It was the Midnight Express's job to be the main event tag team in Mid-South or in Crockett, with the World Tag Team Champions, get a lot of heat, stir the fans up as, as, as much as we could. And for that, Bobby and Dennis were perfect. Then in the pay-per-view era as that came along, we got a, moved into a slot where we were supposed to be the great match on the card right underneath the horsemen in the main event, Flair and Tully and Arn. And for that more cosmetically pleasing era, uh, Stan Lane was perfect. <laughs> so it really, both both sets of, of Express were perfect for the given time that they were being featured. Can't really go wrong with either one, to be honest. But I don't, for some reason, I guess maybe it was... Uh, it's a good problem to have. It's a yeah, good problem yeah. to have when you got two teams like that. Yes, definitely. And, you know, you guys wrestled some of the greatest teams of all time and Skipping almost going backwards a little bit to 1986, and I can't help but think of the scaffold match, which obviously was very painful for you. But what was it like that day with the, you know, obviously the Road Warriors, Paul Ellering, Big Bubba kind of having his little screw up there? But what was your overall feeling on the scaffold match? Still in pain? Um, yeah. <laughs> it's the worst big show match we ever had in terms of quality, and not only the most money we ever made, but the most memorable thing we ever did. So <laughs> you can't have a good match up there. And with the Road Warriors, Hawk had just cracked a bone in his lower leg on a tour of Japan and came back and actually cut the cast off and put his taped it up and put his boot on and went up there with a broken bone in his lower leg, his shin bone. Uh, both of them weighed 300 pounds. If they'd have fallen off, it would have been death. Um, you know, I, I, I give it to all of those guys for going up there and, and doing that. And then, of course, I had that uh, memorable fall, which I always I cussed Mick Foley out. I told him, I cactus. I said, God damn. I said, the one thing I had, I took the most memorable bump in the history of wrestling, me, the fat manager. And then along you come and let the Undertaker throw you off the top of the cage and steal my thunder. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but <laughs> Bubba didn't really screw up. Bubba, uh, he was going to try to break my fall, but as he said after, he said, Jimmy, you fell so fast. <laughs> <laughs> but that that was a plan B. When we when we got there and saw that that was the highest scaffold that had ever been erected in a wrestling event, uh, I said, my God, I, I'm going to die. And and he was trying to uh, to break my fall, and he just he, he lost me in the lights. Oh, boy. Any still residual effects from it? Uh, actually, that's my good knee now. I uh, I tore the ACL and, and had about half the cartilage, the meniscus, taken out. Uh, that was 30 years ago this year. I tore the left ACL and had a lot of cartilage taken out. I actually had the left ACL fixed, and it's now the knee that gives me more trouble than the one I never had fixed. So <laughs> you never don't. Your moral of the story is don't go to the doctor. Don't let doctors mess with things. <laughs> it's funny. um, you know, the residual effects, even some of the managers, because I remember we had J.J. Dillon on not so long ago, and he said he was still hurt from the original war games. 
So oh yeah, he oh my God, that his shoulder looked horrible. He had to have emergency surgery the next day. Uh, he was the road warriors were going to give him the doomsday device. You know, the one up on the shoulders and then the clothesline off, but because oh, there yeah. was a, a roof on the War Games cage, they couldn't go all the way over, and, and, and Hawk had to come off with that clothesline kind of sideways, and it knocked him, knocked J.J. sideways over, and he landed on the point of his shoulder, and it was a horrible separation. Oof. Crazy stuff can happen, even to a manager. With you managing the Midnight Express, obviously you were part of some great angles, some great matches that I I think we remember some great matches, even the Southern Boys, Pillman and Zink, the Steiner Brothers. I mean, the list goes on and on forever. But when you were in WCW, and obviously, you know, there was a lot of issues there, what was the actual reason of leaving WCW? <laughs> the actual person <laughs> that was responsible for us leaving WCW, the same one that ran the Road Warriors off, same run that one that ran Ric Flair off, same run, one that ran a, a number of us off, Jim Hurd, the guy that uh, – I, I won't go into the long, sad story, but when Turner Broadcasting bought Jim Crockett Promotions, they had uh, a company that was still very viable and was the only competition to Vince McMahon. And all they had to do was put some money behind the production, get us full coverage of the pay-per-views, and, and, and stop Vince from being able to bully around little Jim Crockett Promotions and use their weight – to get that product out to the masses, and instead they hired this idiot that used to be a Pizza Hut executive to run the company, the reason being because uh, an executive with Turner Broadcasting, his wife was best friends with Jim Hurd's wife. And Jim Hurd, 20 years before that, had been the studio director for Channel 11 in St. Louis when they did a, a wrestling show locally there. So, of course, he was an expert, kind of like the writers today. And... Uh, <laughs> Jim Hurd, pretty much, uh, he was there for three years, and that was long enough to not only completely gut WCW's business. I mean, we were down to drawing 800 people in Greensboro. Uh, but he set it up so that WCW from 1988 till 1995 not only never turned a profit but lost upwards of sometimes $10 million a year because of his leadership. And that's why Vince McMahon, ultimately, as we've come to find out in the last 30 years, won the wrestling war because he had a seven-year unencumbered head start on being the number one promotion. Hmm. They never recovered. Unbelievable. Um, it's unbelievable. And it's, it's funny to look back at how long it's been since all that has you know, changed. And, and you know, we've got to move forward a little bit you know, just because of time constraints, but you know, we got to talk about Smoky Mountain Wrestling, which is where you, what you established after leaving uh, Turner. And you know, we've had a lot of Smoky Mountain alum on, and we 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 absolutely love talking about Smoky Mountain, and especially even even being able to get uh, Glenn Jacobs to talk about Smoky Mountain and the memories that everybody has of that territory. When you founded Smoky Mountain, what was your goal in mind? Was it just to bring it back to where you enjoyed professional wrestling again? Well, it would not only bring it back where I enjoyed it, but also to to obviously make some money at it and and keep a territory alive and to keep a place for all these talented guys to to work because, you know, at the time the WWF was signing up all the steroid cartoon you know freaks and and goofballs and and goofy gimmicks and, you know, the, here's the Rock and Roll Express and Tracy Smothers and the Heavenly Bodies and the Dirty White Boy and Bob Armstrong and the Armstrong family and, and Dutch Mantell and Robert Fuller and Jimmy Golden and, and, and so many guys that were huge talents that had drawn tremendous amounts of money all over the, the South and all over the country. And uh, suddenly there was no place for, for them to wrestle because WCW was on an austerity program at that point since they'd lost so much money. They were just hiring a bunch of green goofs out of a gym and Vince was hiring people like the Ultimate Warrior that he thought were professional wrestlers. And so, you know, I said, by God, every place else is gone. It can't get any worse. That was my one mistake. I thought in 1991 the wrestling business couldn't be in worse shape. Well, it got worse. Uh, we succeeded in some things. We certainly succeeded in being critically acclaimed for four years. We, we ran some incredible events. We sold out the Knoxville Civic Coliseum a couple of times for the Night of Legends and the Super Bowl. We had great ratings in all of our markets in East Tennessee, Eastern Kentucky, and Western Virginia. Uh, ran upwards of 150 live events a year. 
uh, we have started some great talent. Glenn Jacobs was just one. Dutch Mantel said, I got this kid down here in Puerto Rico, wants to come back home. He's great. Can you use him? Sure, I can. Chris Candido, Al Snow, Lance Storm, and Chris Jericho, their first jobs in the United States of America were working for Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Sonny, uh, you know, so many young guys that that de- deserved a chance and didn't have anywhere else to go because all the territories had been run out of business. And uh, we had a great time. We made a little bit of money, lost a lot of money, made a little bit of money, had a lot of uh, good matches, made a lot of fans, and people still talk fondly about it. So I would have traded it. I would have liked to have seen it done better, but unfortunately that was uh, in the mid-'90s. The year we closed up in 1995, Vince McMahon lost $6 million, the only time in, in history that he's lost money just related to wrestling. He's lost it on football and restaurants and movies, but not just wrestling. And um, I figured up one time also the, the Internet darling of ECW, the money that Paul Heyman lost on ECW when he finally went bankrupt, we could have ran Smoky Mountain Wrestling for the entire time we did, done everything exactly the same, and never charged a penny for a ticket and still not lost as much money as, as ECW <laughs> did. So I feel good in that. At least if you're grading on a curve, we, we won that one. Yeah, there's a lot of revisionist history when it comes to ECW and how it ended up really just absolutely imploding. But with Smoky Mountain, it's really the last territory in the United States. And, of course, you know, like we said, we've had so many guys that just, you know, to name all of them come to mind is – it's a who's who of everybody that was on the roster. But one thing that I really love about it was still the emphasis on tag team wrestling. And, of course, we could talk about Lance Storm and Chris Jericho. But we talk about how the WWF and your relationship with the WWF brought to the national stage Tom Pritchard and Jimmy Del Rey, the Heavenly Bodies, which, of course, managed by James E. Cornette. Now, bringing them to the national stage, and we went into it in depth with, with Tom Pritchard, but I kind of want to get your take on it. The Survivor Series 1993 match, Smoky Mountain Wrestling Tag Championship on the line, Heavenly Bodies versus Rock and Roll Express. Boston, Massachusetts, not necessarily the hotbed for a, quote, southern style of wrestling. What are your recollections of that night? And thinking back, was Boston, Massachusetts the best place to have that match? Oh, my God, I'd have rather had it in a a fucking iron lung, as Chief J. Strongbow used to say, instead of had it in Boston. (laughs) And it's not knocking Boston, but i got to back up. In 1993... We became the only wrestling promotion before or since, and it probably this record will never be broken, to have our tag team championship defended on two different companies' pay-per-views. We, but since Bill Watts had been running WCW and obviously had a relationship with Watts, we started a talent trade arrangement where Bobby Eaton and Arn Anderson came from there up to Smoky Mountain Wrestling uh, and where I sent some guys like Paul Orndorff had been working for me, I sent him down to work for, for Bill Watts. And we ended up on Super Brawl that year with the Rock and Roll Express versus the Heavenly Bodies in Asheville, North Carolina. And that match tore the house down because it was Asheville, North Carolina, and they were obviously not only were the Rock and Roll Express huge there, so was myself and Bobby and Stan. Uh, we were right next to the Smoky Mountain Territory so people could get our TV if they tried. And... Plus, it was a wrestling crowd. And uh, then, of course, uh, Watts left. I didn't trust anybody else in TBS, so we left also, and that, that deal was over. And then it was just a few months later that uh, I got a call from Bruce Pritchard, Tom's brother. He was working in the WWF. He had seen a tape, long story short, wanted to, uh, to know if we'd come up and make a few shots. They had an ulterior motive in mind in that they wanted me to manage Yokozuna because they wanted – Yokozuna and Lex Luger to have a big program, and and unfortunately, Mr. Fuji was a a great veteran wrestler, but not exactly a great command of the English language, and they needed somebody to talk for Yoko. So so off the heavily bodies went to the WWF, and we wrestled the Steiners for the WWF tag team title at SummerSlam in Detroit, which is another great old wrestling town, and had a great match with the Steiners. Actually, I believe it was called the highlight of SummerSlam 93. Look it up on... The network, if you people get a chance out there. Uh, Great match with them. Then I said, what about if I bring the Rock and Roll Express up to the WWF, uh, asked Vince McMahon this, and we have a match for the Smoky Mountain Tag Team titles because the Rock and Roll Express is the most popular babyface team, biggest box office team that your competition, Jim Crockett Promotions and the NWA ever had, so you can have them on pay-per-view. He said, that's a great idea, pal. 
And we, uh, at that point, became the only company ever to have our tag team title defended on WCW and WWF pay-per-views, much less the same calendar year. But the problem was it was in Boston. Boston had never been an NWA town. Boston had never seen the Rock and Roll Express live. Well, we went there a couple of times, but uh, not really back in the 80s. Boston was not a wrestling town. It was a WWF town. And we went out there and had, if you turn the sound down, a tremendous tag team match. It was great. It probably was even better than the one we had in Asheville. And the people sat on their hands, and I couldn't believe it. And then <laughs> then what made me realize I was in the bizarro world is right after we got out of there, they hit the music, and here comes Doink the Clown and three midgets dressed like clowns, too, and the people roared. <laughs> I said, all right, we got too far out of here. This is fucked up. If they want to see that shit, we ain't got nothing for them, and I didn't ever want to go back there again. <laughs> And I like Boston for the food, and, and there's some, some fine fans in Boston, but they weren't there at Survivor Series that night because they saw a wrestling match and shit on it, and they, they cheered three fucking midget clowns and a normal-sized clown. <laughs> and it was fucking sad. But that's, I mean, that's what the, see, that's what the WWF did, unfortunately, is they managed to create a fan base that liked that type of thing, and that's fine, but in the process of doing that, they ran off the wrestling fans that had been supporting wrestling for years and decades and eons. And that's why when, finally, when WCW went under because of all the mismanagement with the Bischoffs and the Russos and the executives down there and just all the horse shit that's been gone over so many times, when when the WWF won the war, they thought, well, now we'll get all these 10 million people that were watching wrestling, five on our side and five on their side on Monday nights. We'll get all of them. No. All the people that were watching WCW, all those fans, they just went away, and they've never come back because they, they said, we're not going to see wrestling here. I mean, even though WCW sucked in the last several years of its existence, it was like an abusive relationship. You always hope it will get better because you remember how good it used to be. And those fans stuck with WCW till the, till the end. But when they realized that all they were going to be able to watch from that point was WWF wrestling, they just left. They said, we can't take it. We can't do it. We'll just find something else to watch. And it's sad, and they, they've never come back. <laughs> so true. And thinking back, how many fans you know used to watch wrestling that still don't? But as I hit the wind-down button, we wind it down here, i got to ask you this because it was so interesting back then as we're talking about WCW and WWF, the war, the Monday Night War that was going on, and one part that Raw always had on that was possibly, you know, the best part of Raw, or one of the best parts, was when you were doing the quote-unquote shoot promos. <laughs> do, you, do you have a favorite one that you did? Because it was so funny. I The, the NWO one was hilarious. But do you, do I think the, the, the first one that, that ended up, uh, Hulk Hogan's a household name, but so is garbage, and it stinks when it gets old, too. <laughs> I, I think, you know, the first one, and that, that, once again, that came about completely by accident. And because, you know, Vince was in a panic that suddenly, you know, for a couple of years, WCW under Bischoff was winning in the ratings, and they'd hired away all the talent. And they, he, you know, Bischoff had the one talent that he had was he was able to talk Turner Broadcasting into spending money in the right direction for once. And and he managed to keep it going for a couple of years until he just didn't have the knowledge of what he really what he'd done and he couldn't keep it going. But because of the panic that Vince McMahon was in, he wanted anything that would get attention and anything that would get ratings. And I had basically uh, been a guest on their uh, WWF.com program, Bite This, B-Y-T-E, in the early days of the Internet, in the early days of Internet audio. This was like 1997. And I said, well, you know, Kevin Kelly was the host, and I think Howard Finkel was on there. I said, what do you want to talk about? He said, it doesn't matter. Nobody listens to this fucking thing, right? Just say whatever you want. <laughs> so they asked me about the parody the NWO had done on the Horseman on Monday Nitro. And it was Hall and Nash and their, you know, their uh, teenage, you know, uh, uh, what's the word I'm searching for, juvenile humor. 
and they were knocking guys like Ric Flair and Arn Anderson, friends of mine. I don't have any use for Kevin Hall or Kevin Nash and Scott Hall and the rest of their clique. And Shawn Michaels is the biggest uncircumcised prick of all time. And thankfully, I finally got away from companies that employ them, and I can actually say that in public because I've always felt it. They exposed the business. They 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 uh, all thought about themselves and not about the company they worked for or anybody else in it. They were all selfish. They were all drugged up and pilled up. They were a waste of human flesh. So I cut a promo on them because that's what I thought. Well, two days later, Vince McMahon calls me at home. What did you say on Bite This? I said, oh, boy, here we go. I said, well, they told me I could say anything I wanted. Well, <laughs> we've gotten more feedback on that one show than anything else that we've ever done on that show put together. So will you do that on Raw? You want me to say what I said on Bite This on Raw? Yep, sure do, pal. All you got to do is just run it by the lawyer first to make sure that we don't get sued. So for the only time ever, I wrote down my promo ahead of time, and I read it on the phone to Jerry McDivitt, Vince's private attorney. He said, nope, it's all opinion. It's all what you feel. Nothing there is actionable. You can say it. So I had him put it on the teleprompter because, you know, when I get ramped up, <laughs> I tend to go off in directions. And I didn't want, after the lawyer had cleared what I was supposed to say, I didn't want, you know, so I had to put it on the teleprompter. They said, nobody's ever read a teleprompter that fast in that studio. And I said what I thought. And people loved it. And so they asked me to do a few more of them. And I would, on occasion, I would do the same thing. I'd come up with what I wanted to say. I'd run it by the attorney so we couldn't get sued, and then I'd say it. Then they started wanting to tell me, well, why don't you say this and why don't you say that? And the reason why that it was getting over is because it was really me telling the truth and knocking both companies and talking about the horse shit sports entertainment that we didn't want to see instead of the wrestling that we did want to see. And when they started trying to, to mess with it, I knew it was going to go downhill, and I didn't see why how it was going to sell any tickets anyway, and I didn't really care to fucking do it to begin with, so I just slipped out of it and stayed under the radar until they forgot about it. But that's how that whole thing came to pass and why those things happened. Hmm. And, and the guys, they couldn't understand why they were letting me, because I was knocking the WWF as well as WCW. Because obviously, first off, if I didn't knock the, the, the company I was working for and just knock the other guys, then it would be the same thing that everybody else was doing. And secondly, the people could tell I really meant everything I was saying. Once you took that away, it was just going to be more gaga, and I didn't want to do that. Those were great. Taking a pot shot at uh, Mushnick was great. Uh, oh yeah, well. that 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 asshole. Uh, you know, he he brought Brian Pillman into into the thing when 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 Brian died, and he because he, he's always had a crusade against wrestling. And I'll admit, the WWF uh, wrestling was not the best wrestling at that point. But it wasn't up to him to tell people what they ought to like or not. And especially when he started, uh, you know, insulting the fans and saying what low class, you know, hicks the fans were. It was that that, you know, that didn't get over with me and I told him what I thought of him. And he got a lot of hate mail off of it too. Yeah, Cornette's right. Fuck you. <laughs> now those were great in itself, but we gotta go to the pot your favorite matches because you've been a part of some classics. I didn't even mention before the very fun matches that I thought was great when it was the original Midnight Express against you were Midnight Express when uh, Paul Heyman, Paulie Dangerously, uh, your old buddy, your old pal, you know, brought back the Midnight Express. Do you have a, uh, a favorite match or matches that you uh, enjoyed with the Midnight Express? Um, what you mean the favorite match between the two Midnights? Um, well, I, I was just throwing out there. Or just some, any, that favorite. Was some yeah, any favorite. Any yeah. favorite. My God, there's so many. Um, actually, uh, just going in no particular order. We had the match with uh, the Southern Boys at the Great American Bash 1990 in Baltimore I thought was one of our better pay-per-view matches, especially since the people in Baltimore hated the Southern Boys when they went out and gave both teams a standing ovation by the time it was over with. Um, we had so many great matches with the Rock and Roll Express, but the one that I, definitely stands out in my mind is, is in Charlotte in 1986 when I was put in the cage above the ring at the Charlotte Coliseum. We sold out the Charlotte Coliseum three out of four shows in a 10-week period and did 7,500 on the other one. So we drew about 45,000 people in four shows in Charlotte to see the Midnight Rock and Roll. Uh, that one was the best one. The, the, the first clash of champions with the Fantastics, we had so many great matches with Bobby Fulton and Tommy Rogers. Uh, 
And a uh, the, the couple of matches, especially in Philly, when we wrestled Tully and Arn for the World Tag Team title and, and won the title in Philly in September of 88. That was a great one. And then, uh, actually, more than the matches uh, with the original Midnight was the, the one thing that everybody remembers when Paul Lee came out and whacked me over the head with that giant shoebox-sized cell phone he carried it back in the 80s. <laughs> I still have that bloody uh, suit jacket up on the wall in my office. So there, there was a lot of them. There too many to, to recall. Oh, yeah, so many classics, so much great stuff. But, you know, speaking of Heyman, I, I just got to get your opinion on him because everyone, quite frankly, overrates the guy, calls him a genius. But, you know, when he came up originally, he, I think he I might actually admit this, but who knows knowing him because, you know, as they like to say, everything that comes out of his mouth probably isn't being truthful. But he was kind of a, a Jim Cornette. No, I wouldn't say rip off, but he was he was wanting to be you basically. But what's your history like with Paul? Do you guys get along at all, or was there really? Well, we, we 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 have at times, and we we started out getting along. We we were not warm on each other for a while in the middle, and now we probably would because we have same enemies. Uh, you know, he. I envy Paul because Paul has the ability to separate business and personal, and he he hates Stephanie McMahon. He doesn't like any of those people. He doesn't like the goddamn product, but he still hmm. will will you know work for him for money because he's he's that way. I can't do it. I can't be around people I don't like. I can't shut up and just keep my mouth shut. Uh, but I knew Paul since he was a photographer. I've I got in the business a couple of years beforehand. He was still a photographer. And actually, I'm the one that that pitched the whole idea for the original Midnight's Invasion, and for them to do that whole thing. And and uh, Dusty agreed with it, uh, based on me and the Midnight pushing for it. Because I, I I don't think that he was trying to imitate me. I think he was always doing his own thing. It's just that when you got a young guy in his early 20s that used to be a ringside photographer that suddenly becomes a manager and is a motor mouth, comparisons were going to be made. But it, it, everybody who knows the both of us always laughs because it's like we're the bizarro world counterpart to each other. He's from New York. I'm as Southern as you can get. You know, he, he's he, – he, even though we have so many similarities, we have so many differences. And I've always said I wouldn't believe him if his tongue was notarized. Paul, he makes an art form out of telling you lies. He really just does. That's his thing. But also he's a great promo. He was a great booker at getting the most out of the least – he got some questionable talent over. I must say that. Uh, I think if this can be said, I'm a better businessman than he was, and that's not even saying much because I still always put art in front of commerce, but Paul was a horrible businessman. Um, hmm. But he was great. Uh, he was great as a manager and great as a booker. And if, like I said, if I envy anything about him, it's that he still can, can put feelings aside and associate with people he doesn't like, and he still – He's a few years younger than me, even though he doesn't look like it. Believe it or not, he's he's younger than I am, uh, and looks like that. But but he still doesn't mind getting on a plane and going to Tokyo, or getting on a plane and going to Los Angeles just to do a show or whatever. I you know, like I said, I don't like to leave the house to to go get in the mail. So I, I envy him for that. But uh, I'm happy doing what I'm doing, and I guess he's happy doing what he's doing, or he wouldn't be doing it. It's funny because we, you, know, you were down in OVW, then he kind of took over for you. It was, it was almost kind of the weird way your careers went. You were in, the, you know, you were in Memphis. Well, yeah. Memphis. Well, I was, I was in OVW in Louisville, in my hometown, where I wanted to be doing what I wanted to be doing. So the WWF had to push my buttons and run me off of that. And they <laughs> knew that the last thing that he wanted to do was go to Louisville and be in OVW. So that's where they sent him, trying to run him off. <laughs> Very strange, yes. <laughs> and you guys, you know, your career is definitely mirror. I mean, you would end up one place, you can end up one place. It's very weird, but obviously different philosophies. And we recently were talking to um, Kenny Dykstra of the old Spirit Squad, and he was saying that he wished that they would put him in charge of Raw, or, you know, you in charge of Raw, him in charge of SmackDown, or, you know, vice versa. And he said that both shows would draw great, but for completely different reasons because of your, you know, different philosophies on the business. And you know, and and I appreciate Kenny saying that. Uh, he he worked with us here at OVW, and and I think that honestly, I don't think they gave him the break that he deserved because he was another guy they signed so young, and and they wouldn't they they kept signing these guys that were prodigies, that were Rene Dupree was another one, was eighteen, nineteen, twenty years old, and they had the size, but they weren't grown up yet. They couldn't even vote legally for Christ's sake, or or uh, rent a car or whatever, drink. 
and and they would bring him up to the main roster before they were ready. I was I couldn't figure out why they couldn't leave him in developmental for three years instead of six months, and so everybody would have some experience. When you got a guy that young, you don't want to put him on the stage like that before he's ready. So I appreciate his sentiment, but if if my wife knew that he'd said that, she'd probably strangle him because the last thing she wants is me booking any more wrestling companies. Elsewise, I'll either have a heart attack or go to prison for choking somebody. <laughs> as a matter of fact, every time I book myself now, on a, I, I do a lot of comic conventions. She loves those. I do a lot of the Wrestling Legends Fan Fests and get to see my old friends, and she likes those too. But whenever I book myself on a show where there's actual wrestling involved, she looks at me sideways. She's like, are you going to get interested in this shit? You're going to get involved in something again. And she'll shake her finger. I'll say, no, I'm just visiting. I'm not going to live there. <laughs> Now, is it true you, you just hate flying? Is, is that a, par- a part of it as well? Oh, yeah. Well, I never liked flying, even though when we did it every day. But then finally, after after 9-11, I was in Louisville, and I said, you know what? <laughs> I don't need to do this anymore, and I'm not going to. And since uh, since then, in what, that's almost 15 years now, I, went, uh, I took a nonstop flight from Atlanta to London for our UK tour in 2014 and a nonstop flight back. I was Xanaxed and unconscious the whole time, and my wife was with me. It was for an incredible amount of money and a two-week paid vacation. We'd never been there. And then just this past Christmas, once again under, under Xanax, uh, because I hadn't been out to California to see the in-laws since then either, so I did that, and uh, I, that's that'll be my flying for the next few years at least, I have a feeling. But what is the legacy that Jim Cornette will leave on professional wrestling when it's all said and done? Oh, my God. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I hope that people will remember. And, of course, a lot of people think I'm insane. Uh, and those are probably people who like sports entertainment. But I hope that people who are true wrestling fans will remember that I always tried to do the dead level best that I could, whether I was a manager, a promoter, a matchmaker, a trainer, whatever, to not only give them the best show that I possibly could, but also to keep some pride and some in- integrity and some credibility in the business and make sure that everybody had a place to go and everybody had a place to work and everybody had a place to, to buy tickets to see good matches and, and, and have good matches and, and just give something back to the business that I was lucky enough to be led into. I think that's why I'm so insulted by most of, of today's wrestling because people – this this business used to be like the mafia. It was almost impossible to get into, but once you were in it, you were in it for life, you were going to make some money. Now any jack leg on the corner can get in the business, but it's almost impossible to make any money at it, and nobody cares. <laughs> I just I think they don't understand the gift that they're given when they're entrusted being in this in this profession to begin with, and, and they should take care of it. Well, it's been absolutely unbelievable. Like I said, we didn't scratch the surface. We didn't even mention TNA. So, I mean, I know we could go all night <laughs> well, if we got into TNA. That's the best thing that we did all night is not mention TNA. 